Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Eric Jordan, and I'm the Development Director for the National Council of Urban Indian Health. And joining me is Dr. Kimberly Fowler. She is the Director of the Technical Assistance and Research Center, also at UCUI. This webinar is sponsored by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration in partnership with Truven Health Analytics and NACUI. This presentation will take approximately 45 minutes to an hour, and it's designed for a target audience of urban Indian health program staff and service providers. This will be the first of four webinars that will take place over the next few months, but more info on those trainings later. And just a reminder, please uh, press mute on your, on your phone by selecting star six. I'd like to take a moment to briefly introduce Kitty Marks and David Shilkett, who are going to help us answer your questions and refer you to the resources that are available. Kitty works for CMS in the Division of Tribal Affairs, and David works for SAMHSA in the Office of Policy, Planning, and Innovation. And just a quick disclaimer that the views and opinions expressed during this presentation do not necessarily state or reflect those of SAMHSA, DHHS, or the U.S. government. The National Council of Urban Indian Health is a nonprofit membership-based organization that represents the health care interests of urban American Indians and Alaska Natives. Based in Washington, D.C., NACUI provides the latest information on policy, training, and research involving urban Indian health. These programs are funded by IHS under Title V of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act and serve approximately 138,000 American Indian and Alaska Native patients every year. Our 38 member programs operate in 41 cities across the country, which are largely located in the same areas that were previously identified as relocation centers. Even though 78% of all American Indians and Alaska Natives live off reservation, funding for UIHPs is less than 1% of the total IHS appropriation. This last point highlights why it is so critical for American Indians and Alaska Natives in your community to take advantage of opportunities that are now available through the ACA. Our goals for this webinar are for, are for participants to understand the purpose and provisions of the Affordable Care Act and the impact that the ACA can have on urban American Indians and Alaska Native populations. Specifically, we will provide a brief overview of the health care law the behavioral health benefits, and the ways to access and enroll in healthcare marketplace. As many of you already know, President Obama signed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act into law just over four years ago. The law is more commonly known as the Affordable Care Act, or ACA. The ACA protects the rights of all Americans, including American Indians and Alaska Natives, to get affordable health care through the establishment of the insurance marketplaces, Medicaid expansion, and improvements to the Indian Health Service. As a result of these changes, more than 33 million individuals in this country who would otherwise not have health insurance now have access to coverage. The new law specifically benefits all American Indian and Alaska Natives in a number of ways which will be discussed throughout this presentation. Passage of the ACA marked a continued commitment to the historical and unique legal relationship with tribes. Healthcare reform reaffirms the federal commitment to provide health care based on hundreds of treaties and numerous laws and Supreme Court decisions. The law supports, strengthens, and recognizes the entire Indian Health Service delivery system as the primary health system for American Indians and Alaska Natives, all the while providing new opportunities to access affordable or free health insurance through a variety of programs. There are a number of new provisions specific for American Indians and Alaska Natives under the new law. For instance, the law permanently reauthorized the Indian Health Care Improvement Act otherwise known as the IHCIA, ending a more than decade-long legislative battle to maintain the Indian Health Service for future generations. In addition to permanent reauthorization, health reform strengthens the entire Indian Health Service delivery system. The law provides new opportunities for IHS, tribal, and urban Indian facilities to collect additional revenues, 
offer more services, and serve their patients more effectively. The ACA also builds a pipeline for new healthcare professionals. This means more nurses, physicians, and psychologists in Indian country. It also means more culturally competent and efficient care when a person visits the IHS clinic in the community. The law also establishes new insurance marketplaces to help control the cost of health insurance and allow individuals to have access to affordable coverage. These marketplaces provide special exceptions and opportunities for members of a federally recognized tribe to enroll in health insurance, but a little bit more on that later. As I just briefly mentioned, the IHS has new opportunities as a healthcare delivery system. First, IHS has new authority to expand services. The reauthorization of the IHCIA, which prescribes the duties, responsibilities, and authorities of the Indian Health Service, allows IHS to modernize its healthcare delivery system and permit tribal governments to make technical changes in the future. Second, IHS can increase providers and nurses. The ACA can improve your local facilities by utilizing provisions of the law to expand your healthcare workforce through new resources that boost the number of doctors, nurses, and healthcare providers in your communities. The Health Resources and Services Administration designated all Indian Health Service, tribally operated facilities, and urban Indian health programs as National Health Service core sites. So vacancies can be filled in your clinics. The National Health Service Corps and the Indian Health Service offer primary care providers and financial support for students in the form of loan repayment and scholarships to cover the cost of their medical, dental, or mental and behavioral health education. For American Indian and Alaska Natives, this means that the financial support offered allows them to come home and help the communities in which they were once patients themselves. So be sure to encourage young people in your area to take advantage of the healthcare pipeline that the ACA has invested in. Lastly, IHS can increase revenue through third-party billing. Medicare, Medicaid, and the Children's Health Insurance Program and private insurance increase payments to the IHS to support both direct care and contract health services. This frees up IHS funds for expanded services. When private or government insurance money, otherwise known as third-party billing, is added to the Indian health system, it helps improve services for all American Indians and Alaska Natives. The new law opens up many avenues for tribal and urban Indian clinics to bill insurance plans. Third-party billing adds new money because tribal facilities are able to collect reimbursements from private insurance directly. More opportunities to bill outside the IHS system will help facilities in areas stretch their dollars. These opportunities also mean facilities might need to consider new business processes and implement enrollment plans for tribal citizens into private insurance plans. Together, the ACA and the IHCIA strengthen the entire Indian Health Service from building a pipeline for providers to increasing sources of third-party billing. However, the law does not provide additional funding for all the new authorities, and additional funding may be needed to implement some of the provisions noted earlier. All this means that IHS is here to stay and will likely continue to get better as we move forward with implementation of the new law over the next year and decade. When key parts of the health care law took effect in 2014, there was a new way for individuals, families, and small businesses to get health insurance. Whether a person is uninsured or just wants to explore a new option, the marketplace gives more choices and control over health insurance. When a person shops at the marketplace, everything is laid out for the individual. All costs are stated up front so the person gets a clear picture of what is being paid and what services he or she is getting before making a choice on a plan. 
Every health insurance plan in the new marketplace offers comprehensive coverage from doctors to medications to hospital visits. A person can compare all insurance options based on price, benefits, quality, and other features that may be important. In the marketplace, all coverage options are stated in plain language that makes sense. The person will know he or she is getting a quality health plan at a reasonable price because there's nothing buried in the fine print. The marketplace makes purchasing health insurance easier and more affordable. The person has several options to enroll self and family, the primary channels being online, phone, paper applications, and in person. Most people willing to purchase insurance will be able to get a break on cost through subsidies and cost sharing opportunities. This eases the overall out-of-pocket cost for health care. In fact, 90% of people who are currently uninsured will qualify for low cost or free health insurance. Also, insurance plan options are clear and comparable based on the cost and benefits provided. The marketplace is a lot like shopping for a plane ticket or a TV. In the exchange, a person is able to see what the plans offer, how much they cover, and what the total spending will be. As you know, these new protections started at the beginning of this year. When key parts of the health care law took effect earlier this year, more people than ever qualified for health insurance that fits their budget. Your clients and other consumers may be eligible for a free or low-cost plan or a new kind of tax credit that lowers their monthly premiums right away. Your clients may qualify for an upfront discount in the form of a tax credit on the health insurance they purchase in the online marketplace. The amount of the discount is tied to their family income, family size, and the cost of a standard plan in the exchange. The discount will go directly to the insurer they choose to help pay the full premium up front. Based on, their, based on their income, your clients may also qualify for subsidies to lower their out-of-pocket costs, including deductibles and co-payments. And depending upon which state they reside in and their income, your clients may be eligible for Medicaid. Insurance marketplaces have special opportunities and cost savings for American Indians and Alaska Natives who, who purchase health insurance. For instance, members of federally organized tribes will not have any out-of-pocket costs using IHS, but they'll be able to go to their local UIHP clinic and receive a referral without any cost to them or their family. And there won't be any co-pays anywhere for individual American Indians earning less than $34,470 a year for individuals and $70,650 a year for families. Members of federally recognized tribes can also choose to change their status in the exchange once a month. This means if circumstances arise, a person can change insurance when needed. And at the end of the day, all American Indians and Alaska Natives eligible for IHS services are exempt from the federal requirements to maintain minimum insurance coverage. So if a person is happy with the health care and services provided at the local clinic, the person does not have to go to the insurance marketplace at all. In order to receive this, your clients must apply for the hardship exemption because it doesn't happen automatically. He or she only needs to apply one time and can do it now or when filing their taxes. Plans available in the insurance marketplaces are required to meet a minimum set of requirements which make them qualified health plans, or QHPs. QHP status means that the insurance plan has been certified by the marketplace. Either the state or the federal government has deemed that they meet all of these requirements. Each of these requirements are meant to protect the consumer and ensure access to the same basic care as others in the marketplace. 
All plans in the marketplace are required to cover the 10 essential health benefits, follow established limits on cost sharing, and meet other requirements. For example, each issuer must agree to offer at least one qualified health plan in the silver and gold level in the marketplace. All qualified health plans will cover these 10 essential health benefits. You'll see that some of these benefits are those that are not available at every clinic, particularly behavioral health and pediatric oral and vision care. And Kimberly will address these in the next section. Even though each plan level must cover the same set of minimum essential health benefits, the value of those benefits will vary across these four metallic levels, the bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. This means that the amount of cost sharing required will differ in those tiers. However, these plans might be the best choice for federally recognized tribal members because they won't have any cost sharing for essential health benefits and may even qualify for the premium tax credit. What this means is that your staff and clients should use all the tools provided in the marketplace to explore options available. And now I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Fowler, who I believe is going to do a poll question. Kimberly? Yes, so we would like to have a uh, and an uh, understanding of if you're understanding the information that was covered in the first section. So we'll actually pull up a poll right now. And that poll will allow you to uh, make a response through your uh, keyboard um, to select the, question, the answer that you think best fits the question. The question is, the Affordable Care Act has one permanently reauthorized the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, ensuring IHS is here to stay. Two, ensured adult vision care and dentistry is covered in marketplace insurance. Three, eliminated health services, IHS dollars. And four, all of the above. Please vote now. So let's see how you all did. It looks like every 87% uh, of you all per, uh, selected permanently reauthorized the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, ensuring IHS is here to stay. That is absolutely correct. The ACA does not provide any vision or dental services for adults, and it definitely does not eliminate IHS dollars. Now let's move on to the next section. The next section that we will be discussing is on the behavioral health benefits under the health care reform. The Affordable Care Act has provided new benefits for individuals with mental and substance use disorders, or MSUD. It is important that these consumers know about the new options available to them in order to take advantage of these benefits. Listed on this slide are some of the reasons that this population is important to target. It has been shown that the uninsured population has disproportionate rates of behavioral health conditions, making them more likely to need health assistance. Many of these individuals with behavioral health conditions are unfamiliar with health insurance and its value, or lack awareness that they are even eligible to receive care. Data also shows that individuals with MSUD are six times more likely to be disenrolled from insurance than individuals with other health concerns, which can put them at a higher risk for paying out-of-pocket costs for care. Consumers with MSUD may find it harder to access and maintain coverage due to their symptoms and income housing volatility. Furthermore, not being able to maintain insurance leads to an increased inpatient and emergency room visits, longer hospital stays, worse psychiatric outcomes, and higher health care expenditures. Lastly, the use of traditional outreach workers with limited training and working with individuals with behavioral health conditions makes the challenge to educate and enroll these individuals just that much greater.
The Affordable Care Act has expanded access of health coverage to over 33 million previously uninsured individuals, including over 11 million who have mental and substance use disorders. Because the ACA has expanded access to coverage and plans must include certain essential health benefits, specialty services such as mental and substance use disorder services, which includes behavioral health treatments such as counseling and psychotherapy, must be covered. No plans will be able to deny coverage or charge higher premiums due to pre-existing health conditions, including MSUD. Lastly, under the Mental Health Parity and Addictions Equity Act, coverage provided for mental and substance use disorders must be no more restrictive than coverage offered for medical and surgical conditions, meaning that all behavioral health services and health plans must be of equal equality as medical service offered. These important and unprecedented opportunities will enable those who most need behavioral health screenings and treatment services to have access to healthier lives physically and mentally. Many of the covered behavioral health services provided in marketplace health plans are for preventive type services. All qualified health plans are required to cover with no cost sharing preventive services that have received an A or B rating from the U.S. Preventive Ter Services Task Force. These include depression screening for adults and adolescents, intimate partner violence screening for women of childbearing age, tobacco use counseling and interventions, alcohol misuse screening and counseling for adults age 18 and over, behavioral health assessments and developmental screening for children under age 18 at certain intervals, and autism screening for children at age one and a half and two years of age. So now let's see how much you actually understood from this section on behavioral health. Let's pull up the poll. Our first question asked, through the marketplace, those with mental and substance use disorders will possibly have to pay higher premiums. True or false? Please cast your votes. Let's see your responses. So great, everyone agreed that this, um, this question is false. Sure enough, the mental and substance use disorders, those with mental and substance use disorders will not have to pay higher premiums through the marketplace. For a second question, let's pull up our second poll. Which of these preventive services are covered for behavioral health patients under the ACA law? One, depression screenings for adults and adolescents. Two, intimate partner violence screening for women of childbearing age. Three, tobacco use counseling and interventions, or four, autism screening for children at age one and a half in two years, and lastly, all of the above. Well did. 97.4% of you selected all of the above, which is the correct answer. Please note that all uh, behavioral health benefits through the ACA do allow for aut autism screening for children at age one and a half and two years, as well as depression screening for adults. In our last section of the webinar, we will cover some of the fundamentals for enrolling American Indian Alaska Natives in the marketplace. So now that you know all the details of the ACA, let's first discuss what are the advantages of enrolling in health insurance for urban Indian health programs. Let's start at the beginning. We learned earlier that a local clinic, such as a UIHP, 
can increase its revenues under the law because of changes to billing practices and expanded access to insurance for individuals. We also learned that some individuals may not have to pay anything for coverage through Medicaid and the insurance marketplaces. So now think about what happens when a person is insured and goes to the local clinic. The local UIHP clinic bills for the services provided and gets paid from the federal government or insurance company for those services. That means that they haven't lost any money seeing the individual, which means there will be more resources for the clinic because insurance companies will pay those costs instead of using IHS dollars. All in all, that means that the client's healthcare needs will be met and it helps the UIHP community leverage those all important IHS dollars better. Basically, promoting the investment in the marketplace to those that can afford it allows for more IHS funds available to, er to help urban Indian and tribal members. So just what options are available for urban American Indian and Alaska Natives without health insurance and with limited outcome? Those that are members of federally recognized tribes with a household income at or below 300% of the federal poverty level won't have any out-of-pocket costs like co-payments, co-insurance, or deductibles for services covered by their marketplace health plan, which can be used at any, any in-network provider. Also keep in mind that many states have expanded Medicaid eligibility and others may follow suit in the future. So you will need to stay informed on your state's process. For those states that have expanded Medicaid in 2014, this expansion creates an opportunity for adults ages 19 to 65 with incomes up to 133% of federal poverty level, which is about $15,521 for a single filer, to actually enroll. With this expansion, certain types of American Indian Alaska Native property and interest are not included in calculation of income for Medicaid eligibility, which could allow for a greater number of individuals to be eligible for this Medicaid expanded system. There are also cost sharing exemptions for Medicaid enrolled American Indian Alaska Natives who receive care at IHS tribal or urban Indian health programs, making out-of-pocket costs more economical. With the creation of the marketplace, the single streamlined application will allow you to simultaneously apply for insurance through the marketplace or for expanded Medicaid and CHIP if you're eligible in your state. Urban Indians may also be eligible for advanced premium tax credits to assist in paying health insurance premiums. Tax credits are paid to the qualified health plan and reduce individual contribution to 2% to 5% of modified adjusted gross income. Keep in mind that tax credits are based on a sliding scale and the annual income must be between 133% and 400% of federal poverty level. Also note that tax credits and eligibility are reconciled yearly when taxes are filed. As mentioned earlier, there are several covered services under the marketplace health insurance plans. All private health insurance plans offered in the marketplace will offer the same set of essential health benefit services. These are services all plans must cover and they include outpatient care, the kind you get without being admitted to a hospital, trips to the emergency room, treatment in the hospital for inpatient care, care before and after a baby is born, behavioral health services as previously mentioned, most prescription drugs, services and devices to help in recovery if an injury occurs or any disability or chronic condition. This includes physical and occupational therapy, speech language pathology, psychiatric rehabilitation and more. Also lab tests are covered. Pediatric services including counseling, screenings and vaccines to keep you healthy and care for managing a chronic disease are also covered. And lastly, pediatric services. This includes dental care and vision, for, vision care for kids. Specific healthcare benefits may vary by state. 
Even within the same state, there can be small differences between health insurance plans. It is important as assisters to help consumers understand comparisons given through the marketplace. So how does a person sign up? To be eligible for and to enroll in insurance marketplace, a person must live in its service area and be a U.S. citizen or national or non-citizen who is lawfully present in the U.S. for the entire period for which enrollment is sought. And lastly, you cannot be incarcerated. Although open enrollment ended on March 31st, please keep in mind that American Indians and Alaska Natives are eligible for specially monthly enrollment periods and may purchase insurance at any point during the year, not only during open enrollment. To qualify for the special Indian protections mentioned earlier, insurance marketplaces will request documents that demonstrate a person's status as a member of a federally recognized tribe. A person can present his or her tribal identification card, BIA form, or CDIB card to the marketplace as verification. There is help available in the marketplace for Urban Indian Health Program clients that need it. A person can sign up through mail, in person, by phone, or online. A paper application can be submitted by email. A call to the designated 800 number listed here where assisters can help with the process is also available. Consumers also have the option to apply in person by going to an identified location in the nearby community. Many of the urban Indian health programs have dedicated outreach and enrollment staff to assist in the enrollment process. In addition, federally funded navigators or certified assistance counselors are available to help with enrollment. A consumer can also apply as well through insurance brokers or directly with health insurance companies. Lastly, consumers can apply online at healthcare.gov, which uses an online application where a person can search and compare plans, submit documentation, and enroll. The application process is simple. Once a person submits the, simple the single streamlined application for insurance to the marketplace, using whatever way best suits him or her, whether online, by phone, or mail, or in person, the system will verify and determine eligibility for Medicaid, CHIP, or private insurance subsidies. The system will send notification of eligibility and will provide information to help the person enroll in whichever program makes the most sense for him or her in their pocketbook, whether for Medicaid, CHIP, or, or marketplace planning. In 2014, people who can afford to purchase health insurance and who are not eligible for a minimum essential coverage exemption, but do not purchase insurance, will pay a shared responsibility tax payment. This penalty will be calculated in two ways based on whichever amount is highest. Either 1% of the yearly household income, which is only levied to those receiving income above the tax filing threshold of $10,150 for an individual, or $95 per person or $47.50 for a child under age 19 for the year. The maximum penalty per family using this last method is $285. Beginning in 2015, the IRS will collect the payment when you file for tax returns. It is important to note that this shared responsibility payment will increase every year. A person may be exempt from the tax penalty if one of the listed criteria applies here. Either the person is eligible to receive services at IHS, or the person applies and is approved for the hardship exemption, the person is uninsured for less than three months of the year, or the person has insurance through Medicare, Medicaid, Children's Health Insurance Program, Veterans Administration and or TRICARE for active duty and retired military, or Healthcare Share Ministry, 
Also, if the person is incarcerated or the person would have to spend more than 8% of household income on the cheapest qualifying health insurance plan, even after tax credits and subsidies. Lastly, if the person has insurance through his or her employer or purchases individual insurance on his or her own, they will not be penalized. Now we will have our last poll for this webinar. This question asks, true or false, members of federally recognized tribes that enroll in Medicaid will not have any co-pays for this service provided at their local IHS or private clinic. Let's see your responses. 96, excuse me, 97.2 percent of participants selected true. This is the correct answer. Members of federally recognized tribes that enroll in Medicaid will not have any co-pays at services received at their urban Indian health center. Let's go on to our second poll question. This question asks, which of the following essential health benefits are not provided in marketplace health insurance plans? One, substance use disorder services. Two, prescription drugs. Three, elective plastic surgery. Four, pediatric oral and vision care. Let's see your responses. Excellent. 100% of you agreed that elective plastic surgery is not a benefit of the marketplace. In this presentation, we have covered information reviewing the healthcare improvements brought about by the Affordable Care Act and Marketplace. In Section 2, we covered the behavioral health protections of the Affordable Care Act. And in Section 3, we covered the enrollment process and options for urban Indians. Here are some of the highlights to take away. One, a person may be eligible for new insurance options through the marketplace. So it's important to see if you are eligible. Purchasing insurance coverage will not disqualify a person from receiving care at the Indian Health Service, tribal or urban Indian health programs. Three, a person may be eligible for advanced premium tax credits to assist in purchasing coverage. Four, a person may be eligible for lower cost sharing that reduces out-of-pocket expenses. And lastly, we should remember that a person may be eligible for Medicaid in states that have chosen to expand eligibility. Listed here are some important websites that contain other American Indian and Alaska Native resources on the topics covered through this webinar. You can access this information at healthcare.gov, urbanindianhealth.org, tribalhealthcare.org, and marketplace.cms.gov. Nakui would like to hear from you on any needs or requests for technical assistance around outreach and enrollment. We are here to provide you with any support in reaching out to the urban Indian communities you serve to address ACA enrollment challenges. Please feel free to reach out to me at my email address, kfowler at nakui.org at any time. At this point, I'd like to thank our guest presenters, Kitty Marks and David Shulkot, who were able to answer some of the questions that you posted throughout this webinar. We also have a few moments if there are other questions that were not able to be answered during this webinar time. At this point, I would ask that Kitty and David open their mics by pressing star six if you would like to address any of those questions. Also feel free to write in your Q&A box if you have any questions at this point. Hi, Kimberly. This is Kitty Marks. A great presentation, you all. You did a great job. You too, Eric. Um, I'll go. There is a question in the chat about what is the FPL. 
And the FPL is the Federal Poverty Level. And there was a reference to 300% of the Federal Poverty Level, which uh, for 2013 is 70,654 family of four and 88,320 in Alaska. And they're on the healthcare.gov um, website. There's um, a glossary, and you can find out more information about federal poverty level by going to healthcare.gov forward slash glossary forward slash federal dash poverty dash level. And you should be able to find additional information about federal poverty levels and household size. Thank you. If there are any other questions at this time, feel free to write them in your Q&A box. But I also would like to mention that there will be an evaluation sent to all participants following the webinar. If you could please be so kindly as to fill out that, uh, that link that leads you to a SurveyMonkey uh, survey, um, that would help us in um, adjusting these webinars that will be happening over the course of the next three months. The link for that survey and evaluation will also be able to be found in your chat box momentarily. This is David Shilkut. We got one other question <clears throat> about cost sharing where a referral was made outside an, an urban clinic. Uh, limitations on cost sharing that an individual would be eligible for would apply regardless of whether the care is received at, at an Indian health clinic or at a private provider. Thank you, David, for that question. There's, there really, um, I know that going to conferences and trainings, there's always questions about when the cost sharing applies or not. But if um, you are, at, and this cost sharing reductions apply to members of federally recognized tribes, and that does include the Alaska Native shareholders, um, if, if your income is below 300% of federal poverty level, which again is about 70,000 for a family of four, then there is what we call zero cost sharing, whether you receive your services from the Urban Indian Clinic or whether you receive services through a provider uh, under the, the qualified health plan that you're enrolled with. And you do not need a referral or contract health service referral if you are below 300%. And then above 300%, there's, uh, there's what we call limited cost sharing so that if you receive services from the urban clinic or if you go to IHS or tribal clinic, there is no cost sharing, but you will need a referral under the purchase and referred program, the contract health service program, in order to avoid having to pay any out-of-pocket expenses such as co-pays. And that's, above, that's if you're above 300% of federal poverty level. Thank you. I'd also like to mention that the presentation is being recorded and will be archived and placed onto the NUKUI website. So in about a week, you should be able to go to www.nakui.org, where you'll be able to find the presentation as well as a link to the PowerPoint presentation. We have one more question. I don't know if our presenter saw. It's asking how or what determines what is included in income? In other words, royalties, oil and gas, et cetera.
Kitty or David, do you have a response to that question? I'm sorry, Kimberly, I can't find the question. Can you go ahead and repeat that? Yes. What determines what is included in income? In other words, are royalties, oil and gas, etc., included? Okay, for for both the the marketplace and for Medicaid, what what the general rule is for the marketplace, especially if if you report income from your income tax return, that is what you report on the marketplace application. So if you're a tribal member and you receive oil and gas royalties and those oil and gas royalties are derived from Indian trust land, um, those, it's my understanding that those are not taxable. But as the person completing that application, you are responsible to determine whether that particular income is taxable or not. Um, you know, it does vary. Some tribes have specific fishing rights income that is clearly not taxable. And so that's why we say the general rule is, is that the income that you report on your marketplace application is the same as the income that you would report um, on your income tax return. Now, for Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, there are additional questions that we ask to make sure that uh, certain income that is derived from trust land or trust resources and from items sold for cultural significance are not counted for Medicaid and CHIP. And so as part of the application process, we, we ask that if you perhaps reported Indian income on your marketplace application or you have um, income on your income tax return that could be deducted for Medicaid and CHIP. There's additional questions where you can deduct that. And, and a good example, what we hear sometimes is perhaps if you're um, a small business, um, you sell Indian jewelry. And you might be reporting that income from the sale of your Indian jewelry on your income tax return. But for Medicaid and CHIP purposes, if those items are of cultural significance, you could deduct that for Medicaid and CHIP purposes. So in that instance, the income might be reported for marketplace purposes if you report it on your income tax return, but there is a special provision under Medicaid and CHIP to deduct that income for purposes of determining eligibility for Medicaid and CHIP. And we have one more question. The question is asking, do state recognized tribal members receive an exemption from cross sharing? Is it, there's, there's two different programs. There's cost sharing exemptions for marketplace. Those are those cost share, what we call cost sharing reductions for individuals. Um, below 300% of federal poverty level and to qualify for that cost sharing reduction under the marketplace when you enroll in a, with a qualified health plan, you have to be a member of a federally recognized tribe and that does include Alaska Native Corporation or village uh, shareholders. For purposes of Medicaid and CHIP, the definition of Indian is the same criteria that is used to determine eligibility for services from the Indian Health Service. So to the extent if you're a state recognized tribal member residing in an urban center and receiving services from an urban Indian program, then for purposes of Medicaid and CHIP, you would be exempt from cost sharing. And for Medicaid and CHIP, cost sharing does include exemption from premiums, co-payments, and deductibles.
So we have about five minutes left in the webinar time. If there are any other questions, please feel free to write them in the Q&A box. And in the interim, I'd also like to mention that this webinar series will is a monthly webinar series. Our next webinar will be on June the 11th at 3 p.m. And that webinar will be covering lessons learned um, from the marketplace from some of the navigators and um, certified assistance counselors from urban programs. So please keep and uh, save that date and more information will be forthcoming as well as it can be found on our website for registration. At this point, I'd like to say thank you to you all for participating on this webinar. If there are any other questions that we were not able to answer at this time, please feel free to send us an email and we will be sure to get that information to you. Um, once again, I'd like to thank Kitty Marks and David Shilcutt for being a part of this webinar and presenting and answering questions from CMS and SAMHSA. And I just ask that you all have a great rest of the day. Thank you for participating. Thank you, everybody. Don't forget to fill out the survey.